people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. Hello viewers, I'm your host Uzma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. The United Nations recently urged India, the next in-line president chair of G20 grouping, to mobilize the major global economies to help the poor economies that were fast moving towards defaulting. The observers anticipate that India, whose economy has remained resilient despite several headwinds, is in a position to help guide and lead countries around the world especially at the economic front, where most of them faltered and plunged into recession following deadly pandemic waves. As India gears up for the G20 presidency in just over a month from now, observers are anticipating a significant shift in the policy framework and decisions that have largely proven inadequate and ineffective in recent times. The failure of this mechanism in international diplomacy is all too clear, with the ongoing Russia-Ukraine war going from bad to worse, and the resulting economic and diplomatic fallouts for all to see. A number of countries around the world are struggling with skyrocketing debt, with no immediate resolutions in sight. With export indices falling and foreign reserves depleting, several countries are on the verge of defaulting on their loans and face dire shortages of essential fuel supplies. In South Asia alone, as many as three countries, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh and Pakistan have been appealing to the global financing body, the IMF, for urgent assistance. India, however, has proven its economic resilience through the grim pandemic wave and the downturn that followed. India is now being viewed as a model to be emulated by all. United Nations Chief Antonio Guterres recently urged New Delhi to mobilize G20 nations to assist those developing countries who are saddled with debt. And I count on India's support in mobilizing G20 countries around debt relief. Many developing countries are at or near debt distress and require multilateral action including the expansion and the extension of the G20 Debt Service Suspension Initiative. The IMF's World Economic Outlook estimated that worldwide inflation will be 8.8% in the 2022 fiscal year. Pakistan and Bangladesh, however, are currently grappling with historically high rates of inflation at nearly 20% and 10%, respectively. Inflation in the island nation of Sri Lanka touched the record mark of over 73% last week. While its neighbors struggle, India's timely macroeconomic interventions and structural reforms have not only assisted in containing inflation by improving productivity, but have also propelled the country to the fifth largest economy in the world. Indian monetary policy has stayed on course to restore price stability and has by and large alleviated cost of living pressures. India has been among the best performers when it has come to containing inflation. Despite dealing with inflation, India was also able to keep their welfare programs on track. From then till today we continue the free food grain program for 80 Crore Indian citizens. Because of prudent and forward thinking economic decisions in the last few years, India is now in a position where it can not only meet demands for its own vast population, but can also help those countries in distress. India's economic model was recently praised by the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres. My feeling is that instead of subsidizing, subsidizing things, it is necessary to subsidize people. And India has today one of the most expanded programs of uh, social welfare in the world, providing hundreds of millions of families with financial support. 
Looking back on recent global events, we see that India has established itself as one of the key players in world geopolitics. India has garnered praise world over, from the IMF and the United Nations, to wealthy and underdeveloped countries alike. India's holistic approach for development has not only benefited its citizens, but has also benefited the interests of the larger global community. Observers speculate that India will continue to be a critical player in global geopolitics. The brand India model of economics, diplomacy and dialogue, and climate change will be an example for countries world over. Moving on. Heavy rains battered Bangladesh past week, flooding many areas in the coastal regions in countries' southern and southwestern regions. A cyclone roared into the Bangladesh coast, killing at least 15 people, destroying houses, uprooting trees and disrupting road, power and communication links. Let's have a look on how the country is coping with this ongoing situation. South Asia has experienced increasing extreme weather in recent years that has caused large-scale damage. Environmentalists warn that climate change could lead to more disasters, especially in places like densely populated Bangladesh. When extreme weather events like cyclone Sitrang strike, communities are left devastated. Mass evacuations before cyclone Sitrang made landfall on the west coast helped save lives but the full extent of the casualties and damage would only be known after communications were fully restored. The cyclone barreled in from the Bay of Bengal in winds gusting up to 55 miles per hour and a storm surge of about 10 feet that flooded low-lying coastal areas. Power and telephone links have largely been cut and coastal areas plunged into darkness. Trisha riders pedaled through flooded streets while some vehicles were stranded and people waded through knee-deep water in the city. Around 2,000 electric poles were damaged, leaving 8 million people without electricity. Most of the people killed were crushed by falling trees. Some 10,000 homes, 6,000 hectares of cropland and 1,000 fishing enclosures have been damaged by the cyclone. Climate crisis is growing and here in Bangladesh, people feel its ferocity. The people of Bangladesh urgently need access to funds that support communities living through the reality of this climate crisis. No major harm has been caused in the refugee camps in Southeast Bangladesh where more than a million ethnic Rohingya refugees from neighboring Myanmar were housed. Around 32,000 Rohingya refugees moved from the camps to a flood-prone island in the Bay of Bengal to stay indoors for their safety. Heavy rain fell on the streets of the capital Dhaka, causing some flooding and disruption to commuters. <laughs> এই বৃষ্টির কারণে আমাদের এই গলির পানিতে তলিয়ে যায় এবং কোমর পানি হয় The United News of Bangladesh a news agency said about 20000 people were marooned because of flooding triggered by tidal surges in the southern coastal district of Bola The government halted operations by all river vessels across the country closed three airports and asked fishing boats to return from the deep sea and remain anchored in the Bay of Bengal. Bangladesh, being a delta nation with more than 160 million people, is prone to natural disasters such as floods and cyclones. The horrific revelation from Pakistan a few days back where scores of human corpses were found rotting on a hospital roof has exposed the brute nexus of Pakistan military and the civilian government. Locals from different parts of the country have accused that they were the same people who disappeared in past few years. In a knee-jerk reaction, the government might have ordered an inquiry into the issue, but the key concern of the human rights activists and other observers remain. What if thousand others who were picked without reason have met the same fate? 
Over 200 rotting human corpses on a hospital roof. The graphic imagery of scores of unidentified human bodies lying exposed on the roof of a hospital morgue in Multan, in Pakistan's Punjab province, has shaken the conscience of people world over. The Pakistani government has failed to provide a satisfactory response as to who these people were and how their bodies have been left to decompose without dignity. An investigation was ordered as soon as these images became viral on social media. Pakistan has a dubious history of failing to locate activists and dissidents who had mysteriously disappeared from the Balochistan province in the last two decades. Some believe these bodies lying on the roof could be the same people who had disappeared. Lost forever to the tactics of the Pakistani spy agency, the ISI. Activists are, are believing that those persons who are disappeared from Balochistan, from Sindh, or from KP, Pakhtunkha, they all were uh, taken to uh, Multan, the first place where they are being tortured or kept for, uh, in the incommunicado was that Multan. So they were there. This is the story what I know from the uh, uh, statements of the these disappeared persons who were recovered. Tariq Saman Gujar, the chief minister of Punjab's advisor, visited the scene after receiving information from a source regarding the decomposing bodies on the mortuary's roof. The incident has spurred a discussion on the country's growing number of missing persons cases, including those involving students, political activists, and other intellectuals from the provinces of Balochistan, Sindh, and Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. In Pakistan, inter-services intelligence, the army, and military intelligence are routinely accused of being involved in kidnapping and torturing members of civil society, forced disappearances, and extrajudicial executions. The Commission of Inquiry on Enforced Disappearances in Pakistan has received 8,463 complaints regarding enforced disappearances since March of 2011. The Commission was created by the government in March of 2011. However, the Islamabad High Court recently noted that it had failed to give victims justice. Only one-third of the incidents reported to the Commission were tracked and little efforts were made to punish officials responsible for failing to follow orders to produce those wrongfully detained. Last year, Amnesty International, the United Kingdom-based rights group, released Living Ghosts, a document about the effect of such illegal abductions on the families of those who go missing. The country's military and its spy agencies remain beyond the reach of Pakistan's criminal justice system. Human rights observers now demand stricter international sanctions on Pakistan for regularly violating human rights. Families of those missing in Pakistan's main cities have been demonstrating to demand justice and to demand the prompt return of their loved ones. Non-governmental organizations have also been keeping records of persons who have gone missing, been slain extrajudicially, and been freed after being detained. However, despite efforts of such organizations and families, instances of forced disappearances are now commonplace in Pakistan, where law enforcement officials continually silence critics. The United Nations have said that forced disappearances have frequently been employed as a tactic to sow fear throughout society. This behavior not only leaves the immediate relatives of the missing anxious and terrified, but it also impacts communities and larger society as a whole. The discovery of the remains in Multan have shocked people the world over. Eyes are on Pakistan and their continued human rights abuses. However, 
It remains to be seen whether Pakistan will ever give in to global pressure and protect the human rights of its common citizens. Time now for Asia this week, the stories from across the continent. South Korea conducted annual anti-terror drills this week, simulating explosive and chemical attacks at a convention center in Goyang. About 300 personnel from seven organizations, including police, coast guard, defense ministry, fire agency, environment ministry, and national intelligence service were mobilized at drills at the Korea International Exhibition Center. The drills which were organized by the Anti-Terror Center of the Prime Minister's Office simulated explosive and chemical attacks along with a hostage situation and fire. Drones and robots were also seen detecting chemicals and extinguishing fire at the drills. In recent weeks, South Korea has held a number of military drills both on its own and with its strategic allies amid tensions with North Korea. Technology has become a major part of everyone's lives. Recently, Japanese ICT company NTT Communications organized an annual business forum. NTT Communications is contributing to industrial progress by utilizing its ICT solutions including 5G. Toru Maruoka, president of NTT Communications, said that the ICT company needs to provide a safe environment for communication to cope with a strong and active society in the future. The highlight of this forum was a new solution using 5G. いつでもどこでもセキュアにコミュニケーションが実現できるこういう The forest industry's goal was to keep the forest environment maintained despite labor power shortages. To solve this, NTT Communications introduced a system of forest industry never step into the forest. Under this, the grass cutting machine will be controlled by an ICT device. Global navigation satellite provides precise GPS information. In the case of smartphones or car navigation systems, GPS information has several meters of measurement error. Global navigation satellite system provides more precise GPS information, reducing measurement error to several centimeters. To realize a convenient and safe life in the near future, entity communications technology is essential. Panasonic introduces H2 Kibeu Field, a demonstrative experiment at its Kusatu factory in Shiga Prefecture. Three storage batteries, pure hydrogen fuel cell generators and photovoltaic generators together can provide appropriate control and a stable supply of electricity. Panasonic says that it is the world's first demonstration to prove that 100% of the electricity consumed by a factory can be powered entirely by hydrogen from renewable sources. It also declared green impact to contribute to decreasing carbon dioxide emissions. By 2030, the carbon dioxide emissions of Panasonic business companies will be zero and by 2050, it will decrease by 1% of the world's CO2 emissions. Panasonic is developing home appliances with the latest technology. In addition, it has been conducting research and development of home fuel cell, NA farm and hydrogen technology. Based on 
に第1号機を世界初で生産したという実績がございます。燃料電池としましては、もう20年以上の研究実績がございます。H2 Kibo Field is a stable and optimized power supply by an energy management system based on the integrated control of the power generators and storage system. The electricity generation amount is 500 kilowatts. It is not affected by climate change. Many companies are now looking for solutions to achieve RE100, that is a global initiative to 100% renewable electricity. Panasonic's one-stop solution aims for a global decrease in CO2 emissions. Moving on. India is a diverse land with many festivals. Every year, people eagerly wait for the arrival of festivals. The atmosphere is filled with zeal and happiness. One of those festivals is the Kali Puja, also known as Shyama Puja or Mahanisha Puja, originating from the Indian subcontinent, dedicated to the Hindu goddess Kali. Let's take a look at this grand celebration. Kali Puja is a major festival in the Hindu culture. While most people in India worship goddess Lakshmi on Amavasya Tithi during Diwali, folks in West Bengal, Orissa and Assam worship goddess Kali on New Moon Day. During the Kali Puja celebrations, the devotees pray, dance to celebrate this Hindu festival in eastern part of India with full enthusiasm. Different rituals, customs and foods are part of the Kali Puja celebration. Devotees gather to take part in different rituals and perform Dhuachi Nach, or a traditional dance, as the priests perform Aarti, a holy Hindu ritual of lights, on the occasion. The major significance of the puja is to call the goddess Kali to destroy the evil that resides in us as well as the outside world. Kali, also known as Shyama Kali, is the first of the ten incarnations of Goddess Durga. दो साल के बाद हम लोग फिर से मिले हैं एक साथ एक साथ हम लोग ये जो पूजा में एंजॉय कर रहे हैं यही सबसे बड़ा बात है हम लोगों का धुनची नाच बोलिए भोग जो हम लोग बंगाली में बोलते हैं जो सब कुछ है पूजा है दिवाली के दिन में हम लोग जो काली पूजा करते हैं यही है हम लोगों का ट्रेडिशन ट्रेडिशनल लेकिन बट दो साल से हम लोग ये कुछ कर नहीं पा रहे थे ड्यू टू सम कोविड एनवायरनमेंट अब हम लोग कोविड से थोड़ा दूर है उस दो साल बाद फिर से हमारा परिवार सब एक साथ हुए हैं इकट्ठा हुए हैं Kali symbolizes divine energy or Shakti. She destroys evil within the world and outside it. The universe owes its redemption to her. Kali, also called Kalika, is the first among ten indomitable goddesses of the Dasa Mahavidyas of the Hindu mythology. Her name also means time, death and darkness. If one looks at the statues depicting her likeness, it's easy to say why. Kali weighs a garland containing the heads of decapitated demons with one foot on Lord Shiva's chest. It's an awe-inspiring, terrifying sight and a story with great mythological significance. We enjoy a lot of enjoy. And today, the last day of our day, that day, we have a dance dance. The whole family members, the family members, the ladies, they participate in this. They enjoy a lot of enjoy. They enjoy, they enjoy, they enjoy, they enjoy. These festivals only reaffirm the devotion of Hindus in one of the forms of Goddess Durga. It also shows the respect of women and brings joy in Hindu culture and society. The essence of India is its diversity and there are a number of festivals that are celebrated under different names. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care. Subscribe Tag TV YouTube channel and press the notification button.